1996, when, to celebrate the 150th anniversary of the last Royal Mail coach to run, to run from London to Norwich, John broke the record again. John successfully represented Great Britain 11 times at World and European Driving Championships. Countless television appearances then followed, some of which included new world records. A regular at Olympia and Horse of the Year shows, John was well known for his spectacular Tunnel of Fire display when he drove his team of five horses through a blazing corridor of fire. This feat has never been attempted by any other showman. Based in Ringfield with his partner Susan Townsend, they run the Swingle Tree, where they provide opportunities for those interested in learning to drive and ride. John Parker, the floor is yours. <laughs> Have done it for me. <laughs> <laughs> and I talked to you before, did I? It was about 15, 20 years ago. Was anybody here then? Yeah. You don't want to say older. Can you remember anything of it? No. <laughs> <laughs> for that. Well, I, I went to Derbyshire, you know, to do a talk. And then I'd been to several talks in the summer of uh, the same people, and nearly all of them. So it gets very bad, because the noise you told at the first one, <laughs> they picked you up at the second or third. <laughs> well, what interests me, I can't hear everything nowadays, I'm getting old and decrepit. Sitting at the back listening to you about your paper bags and stuff. I see where you're coming from, and I'm not going to get into politics. One of the jobs I do, I am an expert for HSE in accidents. And what they call an expert witness, I end up in the court for. And it's a problem everywhere. Everything is a problem when you've got a horse that you don't expect, isn't it? That was my problem for the last 30 years and more. Wherever I took my horses, whether it was England, France, anywhere in Europe, I never knew what I was going to get when I got the other end. And you'll be surprised, so I used 24 horses to select teams of four out of. I had horses that are brilliant, I have now, brilliant on the road, absolutely lousy when they hit grass. They just go off like springs. I had horses that couldn't put up with all the London traffic. Take them in a TV studio, they'd go berserk. I had horses that would go in a showroom, like you say, through fire. And you think, well, you train them for that. You don't, actually. You just pick a horse that does what you tell it. And if you never burn it, it's not frightened of fire, you are. Horses not frighten the fire, not unless you frighten it. But you then get another job, you go on, and it, it could be, well, Norwich. I went to bury the Millennium Barrel or whatever they buried. You know, they buried it outside City Hall, and there's pictures of the coach and Norwich in the year from 1900 to 2000. All bits, you know, they're going to dig up in a hundred years' time. And everybody, look at them, brilliant. They put a lovely manhole on the top of it and somebody nicked the manhole, so they then <laughs> concrete the top end and they put a paving stone, now they've lost it. They <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sitting out there, suddenly they fire the maroon that sends a lifeboat out from the coast that they bought in and put on the roof of the offices. And you sit there, and boom, goes this thing, where you say, God, what are the horses going to do? They just stood there. I jumped six foot in the air. So <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's picking the horses for the job. I, I've been very spoiled. If I wanted to do now what I did between 1966 and the year 2000, I couldn't do it. A, I wouldn't be allowed by cities to do what we did in them. They're getting tighter and tighter. And when you've got a Royal Mail coach and she's 36 feet from the back wheel to the front, all she's noses, 
and they're making <coughs> even Norwich so that Norwich can't get in the city. Mm. I can't get in the city. I used to open the courts, you know, the court assizes, take the judge to the cathedral and then to the courts when he started the session at the High Court or Crown Court. Now, they made it impossible for me to get in the cathedral because they made it impossible for any big vehicle to get in. And where I've travelled all over the country in marvellous things, the roads now wouldn't do it. But I'll give you some examples of how you plan it, you're going to do it, and then you get caught out. Most of them are funny. Some of them aren't, but most of them are. I go to Chester to a big parade. I'm following the Boys Brigade Band, which was the Air Force Boys Brigade, right? And we march through the big, there's a big archway. There in front, they march on. I'm going behind them with a load of personalities on. They're all talking. I look like I'm miserable as sick because I'm watching four horses and not trying to listen to them. And suddenly I thought, I don't know, what's happening up in the arch? And the bandmaster decided to count the march. In other words, <laughs> turn around and march backwards. <laughs> and my leaders picked him up. He actually went between the front horses before he realised what he'd done. <laughs> I then did the Lord Mayor's show and they had the pikeman. I don't know if you've ever seen Lord Mayor's show in London, where you get the city pikemen in old uniforms with their pikes. Well, one of my leaders, a horse called Panda. Now, if you like him, he had a bit of Arab in him. All my old Hungarians did. They are Arab, cross thoroughbred, Libazana. That's the basic breeding of them. And he was a character. He ran the team, I didn't. If I did something he didn't agree with, he objected to it. He made me look a fool on more than one occasion. But he was one horse in five that I kept for that team that would go on grass, on the road, in the TV studio, in any arena, in anywhere. He'd go anywhere. If there were people, that was good enough for him. He wanted to be there. And we were following the pikemen, and they had funny hats on, you know, and that horse wanted a hat. <laughs> <laughs> Susan and my grooms were down on the ground. You could see it. He looked, he thought, I'll have one of them. <laughs> and when he set the pace up, you're supposed to do four and a half mile an hour military pace because of all the army marching, you know. Well, he managed to get four and three quarter miles an hour, he put me up. And he got nearer and nearer these pointmen. And the leaders are there, and now he's about from here to that chair, from that, <laughs> which he wants. <laughs> the pointman now realises he's got this really great 17 horse right up his backside. <laughs> So he runs past the one in front. <laughs> and I'm, if Keystone Cops had done it the other night, we'd have it on the Lord Mayor's show going up Fleet Street. And this horse was getting angry and angry because he didn't get his hat. <laughs> and we pulled up lunchtime when they unloaded the Lord Mayor, you turn and go down on the embankment before the second half, you know, when he has his bit in the mansion in the law courts. And then we came out, pandas ready for his hat. <laughs> the moment we went to move off, he looked, no point when they, they'd knock off at lunchtime. And that horse got the hump. <laughs> and for the rest of the Lord Mayor's show, which is nearly an hour, he pulled my arms out. He threw his head about, he stamped his feet, it wasn't right. When we opened the courts in Norwich, we used to go to the cathedral, come out, go left, go up Red Lion Street, that's where the courts were. They built new ones. So you come out the cathedral, turn right, go round the corner, there's the courts. Panda don't agree with us. <laughs> he knew the difference of taking the Lord Mayor to the cathedral in the summer, 
once or go in three times to open the courts. One you had a bugle, the other one you didn't. If the bugle blew, and they blew the fanfare, Panda knew, so did the other leader with him, he was sharp, they knew it's a court of sizes. When you come out the gate, the hard thing you have at that cathedral, and I had it at the end of the London Norwich run, is getting them square on it. Because as you turn, you can leave a back wheel hanging on the wall. Well, even the people who can't drive know that's wrong. <laughs> so you've got to keep it out and swing them in. Panda, when he's gone past the corner, turns it. He forgets the other two horses and the car. They don't come into it. They're not there. <laughs> and I'm now studying getting him straight. And he's going left. The police cars have all gone right. <laughs> the motorbikes have gone right, but he ain't gone right. He's gone left. Gone <laughs> and you know, that all slammed his brakes on when I eventually got him round to the right. And if you want to feel childish, you sit with the horse team with your grooms trying to turn the corner. When a horse wants to go left, <laughs> you want to go right, he slips his feet in the ground, he's going nowhere. <laughs> and what's worse, you've got all the TV cameras. <laughs> <laughs> well, we went right, and it's the longest time it's took me ever to go about 500 yards. <laughs> he wouldn't trot. He walked. And he walked dead slow. He said, you're wrong, mate. <laughs> well, we dropped him off at the courts. He's confused now. But he's heard the, the bugle again. When we come out, he's now not so happy. And he thought, right, we're all right now. And then he got back to the cathedral entrance. Now I have to go past that to go up the cobble street, you know, Elm Street Road or whatever it is, with a big camber to get to the museum and leave a coach. He ain't going up there, he's going to the courts that he knew that I missed. <laughs> I went right, I got it wrong, I had to do a U-turn, the fact that I stopped and done two of the people out didn't matter. We've now come back to where he knew I went wrong and he was going to finish the job. <laughs> and if you'd have seen me trying to turn right across there to get up the cobble street, you'd have said, why don't he learn how to drive? <laughs> But it's your life, you're a professional, you, you've got to go out there and you've got to earn your money. Now for me to cart a horse team across to, with the backup stuff, to France, and when, before we had the common market as I call it, European whatever it is, when you had the borders you had to go to Dover and then you had to take them in and they have to be booked in as French and then you come back out and you had all the paperwork. Well, I went to Paris on one occasion and it was to deliver a letter from Buckingham Palace to the ambassador, the British ambassador in Paris. We're told we have a police escort that will take us all down the Champs de Lisée, all round, all through the middle, to the embassy. We had one. One little French copper on a moped. <laughs> <laughs> now I've had five French coppers on big motorbikes and the traffic just knocked them off. <laughs> so my moped man and the hope. When he rides along in front, he didn't even look to see where we were. He was just going to ride, didn't that up to me? Anyway, we get to the embassy, and lo and behold, there's been an IRA bomb threat. So now the big steel doors are closed. Well, they open them, bring me in, shut the steel doors, my little moped man's outside. We're there for an hour and a half. When I come out, he's gone. He's got the hump and he's gone home. <laughs> so I'm now in Paris. On my lorries, I'm at the Place de Concorde parked on the side. I don't know where that is. I don't actually know where I am because I did just see a few traffic and follow. And I came out and I knew when I came left in I've got to go right out. And if you look when I've gone along with a coach it leaves white lines in the road. 
the way the wheels are cut. The wheels are what they call dished, so the hub doesn't push through. And the tyres are not dead flat, and they do make lines in the road. Well, I could see the lines, so I knew, right, I'm going the right way. And I said to two of the girls, look for a sign, plus the Concord, it must be one sometime. I'm going along thinking this is getting worse. I've got no idea where I am. Then I see this wooden sign, plus the Concord. Turn sharp right straight into a shopping precinct. <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you want to see a load of very confused French people, <laughs> you're going with a shopping precinct with a state coach. <laughs> anyway, we came out the other end, there was a plus of corn corn, and if, if you've ever seen it, it's not a roundabout, but it's like one, and it's about 10 lanes of traffic wide. <laughs> And my log is looking like matchboxes were the other side. And the Frenchies don't hang about with cars today. <laughs> and I thought, what do we do? Well, now I'm, I'm not a happy man anyway at this minute. I had a bit of abuse driving to the shopping precinct. So I said, I'm going through the middle. And my lot on the coach said, what? I said, we're going right through the middle. And I drove into the road. Several cars stopped because I thought, what's he doing? So I went straight. And I stopped 20 lanes of traffic <laughs> with that coach. And we got the other side, we were right by the lobbies. And this yank had filmed the lot. <laughs> and he said, I know a coaching man in America. He said, and when I get back, I'll show him this, he'll never believe it. So I said, what's his name, Jack Seabrook? How did you know well, he, where he said he come from? It had to be Jack. I said, well, he will believe it because he drives his horses when he comes to Britain. <laughs> Jack used to come to England and drive my horses for a Royal Ascot week because it wasn't worth flying. Where you, if you've flown horses, you know how much money it costs. Mm -hmm. 6,000 quid return just to go to America and back. And you were going to bring six horses over you and a coach, a lot of money. So it's cheaper to hire them. But old Jack used to hire mine and he always said I was mad, so uh, he'd believe it when he, <laughs> when he filmed it. But when you do a run like, you're not getting bored, are you? No. 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 She said I could stop if you were getting bored. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've, I've paid them all to keep you talking about mine. So. No, 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 you put your hand up next time and say, yes, I'm bored still. <laughs> when you do a run like Bristol, London, or London Norwich, and they neither of them set out as world records. They just set out as the first male coach left Bristol for London in 1784, and 200 years later they wanted to run a male coach over that route. That's that was the plan. It just turned out that it was 134 miles and the longest ever driven was 101. And if I could get the lot, it was a world record, but that didn't come up for two years into the planning, they thought of that one. And to do that, I had, I had to hold the reins in my hands all the time without anybody touching them, other than when we were stationary when the groups could come in to change horses, or if I got off the top, because I went to the loo once in that 17 hours, didn't get much to drink, thank God, <laughs> and um, nobody else could touch the reins, you know, they're the rules. So anyway, what do you do now? We had six teams of horses on both of the ones, and I was London was 139 miles. So you have six teams of horses, thank God we owned the lot, they're all ours, so you know them. You're saying about your animals you show. I know my coach horses like people. You know the ones that pull your arms out. You know the pandas who show off. You know the eye loners who's up front who just works. You know the ones that panic. You know the ones that get boiled over. So you make your teams up, so you've got the right combination of horses together. Some will go in the front, 
Some will go in the back. Not everyone will go everywhere. And very few will be as good in the front as they are in the back or the other way around. You balance them up. Some can hold a ton, which that coach weighs going downhill, on the chain that goes from their collar to the end of the pole. That's the brakes. It's done on their necks. Now, when you have a wet day and you slam the handbrake on, 10 men won't hold that coach down the hill that's one in six or one in eight. 10 men won't hold it or take them. And that's where the brakes on. All they are is a block that goes on the tyre. And because it's wet, it just spins. Now, a good wheel horse is two of them will hold a fully laden coach that if you weigh them with the people on, it's probably two and a quarter tons. And they'll hold it down there and they'll break it and they'll steer it. And I say to people, we do teach people to drive, whether it's a single horse or up. If you drive the horse down the hill, you worry about the horse, a safe pace, and let him worry about the car. Because if you don't upset him and you don't push him with the car, he'll hold it. If you get the coach goes over the hill and you haven't already got them back ready to hold it and it pulls them like that and snatches them and they run with it, it will just take them. And they won't hold it. Good wheel horse, he knows he goes uphill. In his head he knows he goes down. And the minute he gets to the top, you'll find he'll start coming back to you. He'll cut his own pace down. You won't even have to do it. But all you have to say to do it is, oh, and they just come back. Always hit the hill at the walk, and then you can control it. So, when you're looking at Bristol, you've got big hills between Bristol and Marlborough. And you've got a one that's 5.7 miles up, pulling all the while. So where you put your toughest team that pull your arms out, on that. They want to run, let them run. It's only at the trot, but they're still every 10 miles an hour. And they're going to pull your arms out anyway. Now, you would think you can sit on a coach and pull the reins and pull them back by force. You can't. They'll lift you out of the seat. They'll actually lift you up on your feet. You've got to work them like you work any other horse. You've got to keep the, the, you've got to have contact on the mouth and you've got to have pressure when you need it. But you've got to release the pressure when you can, once you set them in a rhythm. Like the army, they'll keep going at the same pace as long as you set it and you get control on them. And the control is just a feeling. I can drive 10 miles sometimes with the reins, they're all in one hand. That finger, the rein turns the front pair left. In there, the rein that turns the front pair right. Underneath it, in the same finger, is the rein that turns the back pair left. In that finger there, is the rein that turns the back pair right. Nothing in there, because they'll snap it. They'll break that in, like that. So you have one, two, one. Collect them up, get in balance, close your hand, don't reopen it. If you open your fingers, one of them will pull the rein and you'll, you've lost all control. They're going left and right and everywhere. From then, when you want to turn a corner, pick up, if I want to go left, pick up the top rein, that's the one through there. Bring him back, make a loop. I've now looped about five inches of rein there, behind my thumb. While I'm talking to you, they will have gone left now. That's how quick the response. Pick up the rein, up behind the thumb, they're on the turn. It's like you've done this. Danger. The wheelers, that's the back pair, see the front pair going, they go at all. So now, instead of following them round like that, you've got this. That's when you make go faster stripes up people's cars. <laughs> the they don't like it. They get very angry. <laughs> so, that, I'm giving you a free driving lesson here. <laughs> you grab me horses, it would only cost you 300 pounds an hour, so you're doing quite well. <laughs> right. Rain up, behind the thumb, hand down, get the bottom one. 
as old files, up, down, got the bottom one. Hold the bottom one with a pressure, you've still got a whip in your hand, that's six foot long. But anyway, hold the bottom one, count one, two, let it go. Because what you've done now, you've stopped the back one turning until his feet are where the front one turns. Now you want him to turn. And that's how it's done. So it's one rein up, check another one. If I want to go right, second rein up, go through the middle, pick up rein three. It's like you driving a car. When you drive a car, when you start driving, you think, right, clutch, gear, brake, don't you? When you pass your test, you think, what the hell am I going to the shop now? Hang on, I've got me bread, milk, this. We don't care about the car, do you? You know the car, you don't think of driving a car. I don't think of driving a team of horses, it's remote control. The whole lot is remote control, it's just like you in a car. I've done about 400,000 miles driving forward hands. And if I can't do it without thinking now, then I am thicker than I thought I was. <laughs> but it's remote control. The only time the brain shoots in is when something goes wrong. And it takes one second. You only have to have one runaway with a forward hand to never want another one. Because <laughs> I'll tell you what, that gives you sleepless nights for weeks. And what happens is, when a horse goes to run away with you, and bear in mind, before I drove teams, I was show jumping as a kid, 16, 17 year old. I was born sitting on a horse. And I used to ride nine hours a day, think nothing of it. I was a riding instructor with donkey juice. I, I even used to teach women to ride side saddle. That's right, isn't it? Mm. How did I get that job? Because I was in the army teaching army officers' wives. And they used to learn under Big Boom, who was a badminton winner. And old Big got bought and taught me how to do it so I could do it and she needed enough to. But I used to do it. I trained Jim Fox when he won the, the pentathlon gold in Tokyo to do the equitation. I was only 22 then. But I trained him. I, I, all my life has been horses. Same as Susan, she's been horses all her life. And together we make a good team. If I say it can't be done, she says it can, somehow we do it. <laughs> Usually we're listening to her, you know, the feeding men, don't you? Well, I, I mean, I can, everything in my yard, I control. Provided all the women at work there agree with it. <laughs> <laughs> I come out in the morning and I say, I've got this really good idea. We get hold of Charlie, Fred, Burton, before I can say Harry, and put them together, the girls go, I'll say, perhaps you do it another time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 77, it's took me a long while to learn, but I've caught on. <laughs> Anyway, you get all these teams, so you get a team that you can put in that will take all the commotion of starting. We go from the Bristol one now to the London one, Buckingham Palace, that's when I leave. Five o'clock. <coughs> I've now got 24 hours to finish it to break the world record, so five o'clock. All I want to do is drive. I've got 139.6 miles to go. And that's going all night, all right through the finish. No, it doesn't work like that. We've got the link up with the Lord Mayor of London at the Mansion House, and we've got a link up with all the television studios and the networks, and Radio 4 that's beaming it out on the World Service to New Zealand, Australia, and God knows where, and the satellite being in the right place. I thought, well, that's not bad, that's not much, is it? <laughs> so the clock starts for the world record at five o'clock. By half past five, I'm at the Mansion House, you know, the Lord Mayor's out in London, and I have 12 horses escorting me from the Met and the City Police, who both want to play, because I've started off in the Met area, then going into the city area, and they didn't want the Met men in their area, and the Met didn't want the city men in their area, so I had all them. 
And then Alan Bingo, who was Chief Inspector at Invercore, he said, John, which is your quietest needles? I said, I loan them up on the left. Right, he said. Do you think the Assistant Commissioner could ride his horse next to that one? And if I have a man on his left, if he jams him into your leader, can you keep that leader straight so he don't fall off? <laughs> <laughs> I said, can he ride? He said, he's had six hours, but he wants to <laughs> Well, every start and the radio message comes through because the Saturday England were playing Scotland at Wembley football. So, what is in the fountains in Trafalgar Square? About 800 Scotsmen stoned out of their head, and now they're petrified, they're going to mob the coach. Well, all they did was wander around. Well, they couldn't stand up waving and clapping and jeering, so nobody robbed it. But they brought out 30 coppers to deal with them. Especially the local gendarme came out. Now, we haven't gone anywhere on this world record run yet, have we? Only gone a mile. <laughs> when I go to the mansion house, I had to wait an hour. And you sit there thinking, I'm on the drive. I, I don't look like I suffer from nerves, but I do like anybody else. Failing to do it wouldn't have meant anything. If I hadn't managed to get the distance, there was another man there and Susan ready to take over. And you just fail, you fail. The only thing that would really upset me if I failed was letting all my grooms down, who I had eight or nine of our own, and every BDS driving member that lived in the area, within 20 miles of Wingfield, I think, where I am, came out over the weekends and learned how to harness for an answer. Learned how to put horses in. And they backed me, and I wouldn't be that face them. That was what worried me. And don't forget, we had six horse boxes out there and 24 horses. And a crew of four with each truck. Each lorry had four, a driver and three grooms in it. So, yeah, a lot of people, in my world record, it's everybody's. It's everybody who backed me up. I couldn't drive if the horses weren't there. And if them people weren't up all night, the horses wouldn't be there, would they? Anyway, we start then from the mansion house, Chris S. Akabuchi. Do you remember him? Yes. Olympic medal winner. Yes. <coughs> well, he, he's a right comedian, isn't he? Yes. He's two people. He talked so much sense to me driving along the road when it was quiet and act like a complete idiot when he got people around. And he was doing the record breakers, BBC One, and they were filming it all the while. And after I got 70 miles, he said to me, when will you come out of the pain barrier? <laughs> and I said, if I get 20 more miles, I'm out of it. You've been in it about 10 miles, he said. And I thought, this is odd. How do you know? When I had, what's his name for who wants to be a millionaire? Tarrant, on the Bristol run, and I was an idiot. <laughs> and then uh, Chris Akabuchi, who I think is going to be an idiot, knows all this. He said, John, I never ever tied up running a race. He said, but the pain barrier is training when you're pushing your body beyond the limit it wants to go. And I was. I have, on average, in my hand, when they're not pulling me, it's 28 pounds of weight. When they're pulling me on a bit, it goes up to 60, 70 pounds. That's the weight I'm holding. If you had a bag weighing 60 pounds and pulled it up on four bits of leather, that's the weight. When they really get hold of me, it goes up to a hundred plus. And that's when it lifts you out your seat. That's why I don't sit down. If you actually looked at my coach, the seat is a box seat set at an angle like that. And the angle of the footboard, I'm not standing, but I'm nearly standing. I'm like that. And now I've got this to pull the weight on it to be back. That's where the, the, you, through your knees and your back. 
and old Chris worked that out. Well, we stopped, my girls got the one change over, and there was a load of little black kiddies there. And they said, why is that horse doing that? And it was all filmed this, and the horse's baby, you know, they do is hammering the concrete. So Carol said, oh, well, he's got one of them said, oh, he's getting excited. So the kid said, oh, he knows Chris Akabuse is coming, does he? <laughs> Well, Dickleborough. Yeah. Does anybody here live there? Good. I don't know. <laughs> Dickleborough in 1820 something stopped the Royal Mail coach travelling from London to Norwich because they had a street party. And the mail coach had to stop. They cleared the table quick to get it through. And the village was told, if ever this happens again, every single villager will be put in jail. Because you to slow the raw man up when it, in its day was a prison offence. <laughs> to stop it was death. <laughs> you were hung, hanged. And that's it. Well, they did it then, and believe it or not, they did it when I did my run. <laughs> we came through Dickleborough to find the road is closed. They're having the fate. Actually having their fate. They sharp, the old vicar, you've got to give him ten for trying. He knew Akabusi was on. He knew the coach is coming. He wanted pictures of the coach at the opening and he wanted Akabusi to open it, and he got it. <laughs> he should have been locked up. Yeah. Well, we sat there, and honestly, we couldn't move. We couldn't get out. It was impossible to get out. The people just swarmed it. And we had well over a million people on that run. And we were raising money for children, not the children, what is it, save the children. Because Princess Anne thought it would be a good idea. And they made a lot of money, but it gave me a lot of problem. Because I had to wait at the changeovers 10 minutes, 20 minutes, while they raised money. And my hands just wanted to keep going. Once you stop, your fingers lock up. You have to then get your physio, which I had. I mean, all these people worked on it, pulling their hands and their arm up your back and twisting your neck, keep your mobile. I've been lucky, I've had a lovely... Are you bored, yeah? No, no. <laughs> well, she's signalled me times up so many times. So said, <laughs> <laughs> you know you're paying for the minute, don't you? You've seen our accounts. Yeah, well, it's, you know, it's, it's in old money, you know, pound shillings and pence, I'll tell you, but I don't understand all the money. I'd like to know about the UBEX. Right, charge. well, anyway, we then do the run, and we're coming into Norwich. We have... Every police force, the Met, the, well, the Assistant Commissioner needs us out. That's the Met. Then we get the City of London Police, take us right through. Then we get the Met again. Then we get Essex Police. Then we get Suffolk Police, who closed the A14, so I could have it to myself when you come off the A12 until you turn down the 140 and all the trucks in back, everything, till we get the Norfolk. Then we had a stopping little look of a sergeant who, who they got off a desk job. <laughs> and he, he was, he couldn't have been more awkward. He ordered me into a lay-by to let the cars behind go past. They'd been following me for miles, they don't want to go past. He threatened to arrest my vet, yeah, because the vet said, we've got to get out now. And he said, if you get him out, I'll arrest you. So while you are standing there, I'll run him bloody down. I just drove out there. <laughs> <laughs> and we got up to the maid's head, as you go into Norwich. And we had a change there to that like Panda. Panda was 26. He had his 21st birthday at my place. And... I said we'd have an open day and the money could go towards the church roof because they need a lot of money. 
So we had the local ladies who were going to sell tea and, you know, like the garden fate. I said, I think it might be bigger than that. So we organised everything in. They still came with their big and buy song, you know. And two and a half thousand people turned up for his 21st. When it was 25th, we said we'd do it again. We didn't expect the numbers. We got over three and a half thousand. And they came from Liverpool, Scotland, everywhere. You would never believe how many people came. We had five fields full of cars. All my grass was just full of cars. And Panda was then totally retired. They wanted me to let him loose with his sash around his neck. <laughs> he'd have gone berserk, he'd have jumped the fence and run around with the people I'd then do it. So I kept saying all the way up, they kept coming from the radio car, over the radio that I had, Paul Liney actually had it behind me. Have you made your mind up about Panda? I said, no, not yet. And I got to Ipswich. Well, the team that came out of London did to the mansion house, came out, were boxed on to Romford, and then came from Romford through nearly to Chelmsford. They were then lifted up in the lorry as Team A, because Team B had now gone in, and Team A were brought home. Then Team B, when they finished two stunts, they were brought home. That left three teams to run into the night. Now, the first two teams, by the time you had late morning the next day, they, there's a new day, isn't there? They've been stable, they've been to bed, there was another day. So I actually was using eight teams, really. The six, but two run twice. Now, I wanted Panda to go the last bit into Norwich. It wasn't only me, all my groups did. He was so upset because he weren't playing. They were driving him round the village, and, but that weren't it. He wasn't going in the lorry. And I made my mind up about halfway between Ipswich and Dick that Panda could come out. And Akabusi said, is that because he's come through that he's really fit now? I said, no, I'm fit enough to hold him. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, really? I said, you haven't seen nothing. Really. <laughs> well, he was... I can't remember the name of the feed place as you go into Norwich at Newton Flockman or wherever it is. It's a big feed place. <laughs> well, the TV camera is up on the tower there with a, with a film crew for BBC One. And they're filming the coach coming down the road towards Norwich. And there's another TV camera with a beep filming Panda <laughs> standing, waiting. And he's waiting with another lead horse because I was just going to change the front two. And he sees the coach and that film of him just changed his face. You know, I'm going to do it. I'm here. He's puffed out like a little what's it. <laughs> Well, we put him in, and he'd never worked with Chop Long. It was the other lead horse, he'd never seen him. So this new horse, he's just rubbish. <laughs> and he said, oh, he, he don't like with having rubbish with him. <laughs> and we got a lovely film shot, actually, that went out on television. I'm now coming towards Norwich. There are keep left signs, and the leaders are working their way across the road to bump into them. <laughs> And I'm doing all I can to bring them back left. And it was that old bugger. And he was sticking the other one with his eyes, shoving him at the deep left side. Akabushi said, will he hit it? I said, no, watch him. And they got about four yards off it and he pulled the horse off and said, you idiot, you nearly hit that. <laughs> and that horse was all, so I've been on that box seat for 17 hours. And you've got to help thinking. <laughs> When we came to the cathedral, I thought we've had two arches, one at Buckingham Palace, where I started, you can hear, because we've hit them with the royal carriages, and the other one, the cathedral. And now the one in the cathedral's the trouble one, because I've got him up front. <laughs> and all he wanted to do was get with the people. And we got a beautiful film of him standing there. When it's finished, I did that. Oh. <laughs>
That's it, he said. Well, when he died, but I had him put down, but I mean, he, he, he was going. He was 28, and he managed to break my nose and my cheekbone because he was stuck down. I was getting him up, he half cracked me one. And you know, we buried him at home. And he had more wreaths and flowers because it all went in the horse and hound and everything. <coughs> he had so many flowers covered, it was ridiculous. About a year after he was dead, I had a family came from Liverpool and they rang up and said they were in the area, could they come over and see me? And I said, yeah, fine. Then he said, we came to his 21st, we've seen him everywhere, and they wanted to see his grave. And they had bought flowers. Now that's the power a horse has. And I'll leave you with one other little bit. When we did the Radio One Road Show, when Radio One was the big pop channel, wasn't it? Yeah. We went with Simon Bates, who did the morning, and ran York to London for sport aid. Are you not bored yet? No. Oh, fuck that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, sport aid. We left York, we used eight horses, so each team did a run a day, and it took seven days to get to London. And we had the batteries and the, and the radio unit built onto the coach. We had a Range Rover behind that had its own aerial that beamed it to another aerial that moved every night, that sent it down the telephone lines, and it came out live over the radio with brilliant stuff. And when you had an earphone, there was a quarter of a second difference between you speaking and getting it back through the radio earphone. We had a horse called Tessa. We basically saved her from the knacker man. And the only thing, Tessa was a lovely old mare, but what she couldn't stand was people screaming and shouting. And this is what the power of radio can do, the power of television can do. It came out, I said, look, I'm going to have to use Tessa first thing. I don't want any screaming, because they wind the crowd up. And there's always a crowd with Radio 1. They've got pop stars, did not they? And they wind them up and scream and shout, and Tessa wouldn't, she wouldn't take her. So he came over and said, I don't want any screaming and shouting, because the horse will get worried. We had gone four days into that run, and every time it was said, when we had people coming just to see that horse, and bring it carrots. And that's people and horses. Mind you, our bonus is different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Royal Windsor Horse Show, last thing, and then I'll tell you a joke. Royal Windsor Horse Show, champion Arab comes out, I'm leaning on the side of horse box, talking to my mate who's just round the edge, and I said, God, wouldn't that look great in a set of harness? The woman went mental. <laughs> She went to the clock helicopter and come down again. And she tore into me and she said, and as for your bloody friend, and Prince Philip said, have you got a problem? And she <laughs> did. <laughs> anyway, joke, right? Vicar is selling, uh, no vicar's in here, are they? <laughs> selling horse and cart and harness. He advertised in the paper. So along comes this Irishman, he said, oh, I've got to have a look. And he went to the vicar and he said, can I see the horse cart and harness? Yes, said the vicar, here it is. Can I have a drive? He said, yeah, you can. So he put it together, the vicar gets in, the Irishman's in. The Irishman says, get up! And the horse didn't move. And the vicar said, no, no, my son, I trained him. Thank God, and it's rotted off. <laughs> so he got down the road, and the bloke's yelling, whoa, 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 and the vicar said, no, my son, look, think I trained him. Amen, and he stops. <laughs> so the bloke gets his money out, I'll have it now. Ah. So he goes down the pub, ties him outside, has a lot of drinks, brings his mate out, This is down in, in the south coast, and he says, you watch this, he said, they get in the car, and he thinks, he says, look, Right, he said, watch this. Thank God, and it drops off. Well, they're both half cut. 
thunderstorm, boom, lightning, phew, all bolt. Where is the cliffs coming up? Said it's straight the cliffs. And he's yelling, whoa, 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 and lots of other things. All don't slow up. He knows it's something to do religious, you know. Our father, which I've never known, he goes right through the Lord's Prayer. And he gets the edge of the cliff. And he said, oh, man, and it squeaks to an old. He took his out and said, thank God for that. <laughs>